Welcome everyone to the Science Behind Animal Behaviour webinar series, where we will be focusing on the topic of how animals learn. My name is T.I. from the Animal and Veterinary Service, a cluster under the National Parks Board, and I will be your moderator. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Susan Freeman as a speaker today. Susan is a psychology professor at the Utah State University and is best known for her work in the application of applied behaviour analysis to captive uh, and companion animals. Susan teaches seminars and courses on animal learning online with students from over 55 countries, including Singapore. She also consults with zoos and animal organizations around the world. Therefore, we are very excited to have here, her here today to share her knowledge in how animals learn and the science behind animal behavior analysis or ABA. I'm sure all of you are very keen to ask her questions and you may do so anytime during the webinar by typing into the chat box uh, to the username Q&A and anytime during the session. Gentle reminder to keep your microphones muted as well. Thank you. So without further ado, we will hand over the time to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Chiai. It's great to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to work with all of your wonderful uh, participants. And hello to Al and others who I know and have taken my class. So today, um, I'm thrilled to contribute to the Science of Behavior series. Let me uh, share my screen and we will get started. And I'll just, um, I heard you say that chat would be disabled, uh, but if you want to enable it, I'm happy to add people type in there. Otherwise, we'll we'll wait for the Q&A. So I used to call this presentation, How Animals Learn, and then realized that what I'm teaching are the universal principles of behavior and learning. And they cut across species, although they need to be custom fit when we talk about teaching and training for each individual. So these are the topics for today. What is behavior for? The science of behavior change. Obstacles to the scientific analysis of behavior. The ABCs, a little bit about errorless learning and some ethical considerations because once we are in the position of power to change another organism's behavior, then our ethics become uh, equally important uh, as our skills. So I want to take a pop quiz, a surprise quiz, and uh, have you write down, please, at your desks, the answer, or maybe into your phones, the answer to these questions to help me make an important point. Eyes are to write down what eyes are for. Ears are two, write down what ears are for. Legs are two, behavior is two. And if you're like the thousands and thousands of other students that I've taught over the many years, you are very fluent in saying what eyes are for, what ears are for, what legs are for, but when asked what is behavior for, there is a pause. You have to really dig down deep in your um, thinking to come up with an answer to the question when posed that way. And I think that's a problem, that we don't teach children at the youngest ages, two years old, uh, the same as we do what their eyes and nose and ears are for, what behavior is for is one of the reasons why I think this information uh, is not as accessible as it should be to make a better world. So behavior is for, I'm sure you've come up with a good answer by now, behavior is for operating on the environment, to change it in some way. We all behave to be effective. 
this is an important thing to understand before you start training animals or teaching. We behave to have an effect on the environment. We're all behaving to be effective. Nobody is behaving to purposefully be ineffective. And when we ask effective for what end, to what goal, the answer in its most simple form is to gain reinforcers, that is consequences or outcomes of value, and to escape and avoid aversive stimulation like punishment and physical abuse, force and coercion. So what is learning for? Well, first we need to start with a definition. And I think that part of the problem is that we jump into these debates online and at conferences without having common definitions. And so we are often talking at cross purposes. We don't, we're addressing different, different things because we haven't started our discussions with a careful um, agreement on what our definitions are. So learning from behavior and learning science called behavior analysis is defined as behavior change due to experience. And I think that this is a most elegant, simple definition. Learning is when you behave and the outcomes of your behavior, that experience contacting the environment allows you to repeat what you did or change what you did to be more effective. The ability to learn is the product of natural selection. So it is itself an evolved mechanism for coping with the challenges of a changing environment. I always ask my students to imagine a world where as the environment changed moment to moment, the weather, the people who were nearby, our level of hunger, our bank accounts, as everything in our environment changes so rapidly, moment to moment to moment, Imagine what life would be like if we didn't change as the environment pressures us. We would be like a stick in the wind. We would just break. So learning does not give us the, give the species the tendency to behave in a certain way. We're not talking about what all bears tend to do or what all boys tend to do. We're talking about individuals. Learning is what gives each individual the tendency to modify its own behavior to suit a particular situation, a particular context. Learning is evolved modifiability. Learning takes up where reflexes and innate behaviors take leave off. In other words, our reflexes and our innate patterns would not be enough to cope with the environment that changes as rapidly and as consistently as our environment changes. We say the only thing you can count on is change. So it is this ability to learn, to change what you do based on experience that is allowing us to adapt to situations for which our innate behavior is inadequate. And many people who are working with non-human animal learners think that their behavior is largely innate. In fact, science tells us that the innate repertoire of animals is quite small and learning repertoires are infinite. We learn our whole lives long. And if you don't have a copy, an old edition will do of Paul Chance's Learning and Behavior. This would be an excellent introductory book. Um, and these are quotes from that chapter one. So imagine that world. It's an ever-changing planet. Imagine that we had no mechanism to control our own outcomes. We had no interface with the outside world. 
Imagine where past experience with the environment didn't give us feedback, outcomes, consequences about how to do it again better in the future. In fact, the concept of, of wisdom is all about this ability to learn. Wisdom is about experience and then using that experience to do it again better in the future. So I feel, and people in my profession would agree, that we think of behavior and learning too narrowly. And I call that our cultural fog. We are bound by our cultural understanding. And sometimes it's hard to get the science facts, not only into the discussion, but influencing what people do. So the most basic law of behavior is that behavior has function. And by function, we mean it has a purpose. We're behaving for a purpose. That purpose is in the outcomes that we behave to get or to escape. And I laughed at this picture of the boy, although he's having a really big temper tantrum, we see that he had enough control over his own outcomes through his behaving system to pick the one shady strip in the park before he threw it down. And our most recent science, that is science as of the last, say, 15 or 20 years, shows us that learning goes on even prenatally, before we're born, before we hatch. We already have this system that allows us to use our experiences, our behavior consequence experiences, to shape what we do after we're born. And here's an example with cuttlefish. These researchers found that before they've even hatched, cuttlefish embryos, which is what we're looking at here, can peer out of their eggs and spot potential prey. Embryos exposed to crabs preferred them as prey later in life. And those embryos that never saw crabs through their translucent egg sacs did not prefer crabs later in life. And in the last 10 or 15 years, there are university research programs in Australia and here in the United States, maybe in Singapore as well, that are demonstrating that if we hold to our definition of learning as behavior change due to experience, that plants can be said to learn as well. So in this particular study, they did a Pavlovian demonstration as Pavlov um, sounded the metronome before food and mouth, metronome, food and mouth, and then metronome alone elicited salivation. What they did was they paired the current of an air of airflow from a fan and then light. And we know that plants move to the light called phototropism. So by pairing the airflow from the fan and then the light, they demonstrated that for those garden peas who had that experience, even when there was no light presented, just the airflow from the fan, the peas moved in the direction of the airflow. And I have many other studies of plant learning. So when we see this work with these alpaca, and oh, I'm sorry, I, yeah. And I'll, I'll mention the zoos only to give them credit and honor for their great work. Um, I have removed some of the names, but I probably didn't close the right slide on this one. So excuse me. Let's take a look at this work between this trainer and her harness training.
there was an incredible amount of very refined skill in that training session, the way that she took the harness off and still continued so that the harness doesn't become a context cue. Her verbal cues and her hand gestures are the cues, was very, very expert. So no force. People are forcing alpacas and llamas to get into harnesses all the time. And we see that it's simply not necessary. So I wanted to introduce you to the longstanding science um, called behavior analysis that allows us to uh, train in this way. Applied behavior analysis is the science of applying the experimentally derived principles of behavior. So the principles um, studied in the laboratory uh, to bring it out into the field to have impact on socially significant behavior, not trivial behavior. The applied part of the word is talking about being in the field, helping all the learners around us, species bar none, any species. By behavior, we're referring to a special definition. We define behavior as what an animal does that can be measured. And so we specialize in observable behavior because it's most clearly measurable. It's not to say that animals don't think or feel, but only to say that until we have more advanced measurement tools, we can't know what another animal is thinking I can't know what you're thinking. It's always an inference. And the word analysis refers to analyzing the relations between behavior and what comes before it in the environment called the antecedent and what comes after it in the environment, the purpose or function the behavior has that is the consequence or outcome. And there's an, a very nice discussion of this applied science um, in Wikipedia. So here is a wonderful example. And this is an old example in my work now. It's from Disney's Animal Kingdom, where the keepers were afraid they would step on the poison arrow frogs or dart frogs. And so what they did was use a learning solution. They taught the frogs that when these acrylic boxes are put on the ground, if they go in the back door, then the keepers will open the front door and the effectiveness will be access to the flies, the purpose, the function from the animal's point of view for going in the box is access to flies. And now they're no longer worried about um, cleaning the cages. So whether we call it teaching, training, consulting, conditioning, all of those words are the same to me. They mean that we are changing observable behavior by changing conditions. Now we know we can change behavior in other ways, uh, medically, chemically, and so forth. But as trainers, teachers, behavior analysts, this is our focus changing behavior by changing the environment. What comes before the antecedents and what comes after the purpose for behaving, the consequences. So I like to show Skinner, Skinner quotes because very few people in the public know his work. Most people have been taught that it was um, bad and irrelevant and uh, that's hugely erroneous. He said back in 1953 that by looking only inside the organism, explaining behavior by what's innate, by its genes, by its brain, by its medical background, we are becoming blind to those things in the environment that shape behavior. And those things in the immediate environment and in the animal's learning history will explain behavior uh, will explain a part of behavior that cannot be explained by any other um, science. And that's the part that we focus on when we train. So behavior is lawful. And often people 
um, find that difficult depending on their cultural learning. They find that difficult to believe because we're taught so much of behavior is coming from the inside out, independent of our experiences. And I laugh to say that you don't hear anybody uh, disrespecting Newton or Einstein, expecting that their feet will land on the ceiling. We accept that behavior is lawful from certain sciences, but we tend to push back when a behavior analyst says, learning behavior is lawful as well. There are certain principles that account for how we learn. And the more we know about it, the, the more we can teach without force and coercion. So here's an example of learning in the wild. Animals are learning as much in the wild as they are in captivity. It's that their conditions are teaching them or shaping them to do different things. So if you notice the cowbird up at the, about the 11 o'clock spot, that bird is not like the rest of the nestlings. It's a cowbird and that species of bird lays their eggs in other species nests and then their young are raised by these other species, Phoebe birds and sparrows, for example. And yet the cowbird, even though it's reared with uh, sparrows, ends up vocalizing in cowbird characteristic ways. So back when I was a psychology student a long time ago, um, that was an example of language as innate behavior. And then in 2006, Gros Louis discovered that when these cowbirds are starting to vocalize as fledglings in the nest, not even as, as, um, as babies in the nest, the female cowbirds in the range answer back, but only when their vocalizations are more like cowbird and not like the language of the birds they're being raised with. And so we see an instance of what we call differential reinforcement. They reinforce the cowbird sounds and they extinguish, they do nothing for the sparrow sounds that the cowbirds may make. And over the repetitions, the cowbirds are shaped to speak cowbird, cowbird based on the reinforcers the females in the range provide. Now, some of you may be thinking, I did, but what about hearing a female cowbird is a reinforcer, a behavior strengthening consequence for a cowbird. And for that, we would need to switch our science to perhaps brain science or genetics to talk about how that has evolved. So what are the obstacles? I'm always hoping that if we are sensitive to why our cultures tend to uh, not accept a science of behavior and learning, that we would be better ambassadors, better teachers and disseminators of the science to be able to help people do what they do better. So there's a lovely book called How to Think Straight About Psychology, a small, easy to read monograph. I highly recommend, again, an old version so that they're inexpensive. Stanovich, the author, says, we must give up the idea that personal recipe knowledge of behavior is adequate, that this is the only psychology we need. Most of us are teaching and training from personal recipes. And yet you would not want your surgeon to take out your tonsils based on personal recipes. You would want them to be the applied medical representation of a, a biophysical science. And yet when it comes to behavior and learning, we accept one self-appointed expert after the other with no credentials or few credentials, just because they maybe have a 
good talent for behavior, but that shouldn't be enough anymore in 2022. One of the biggest obstacles are what's known in psychology as hypothetical psychological constructs. By constructs, we mean concepts that label tangible things, but they are not themselves tangible. A concept is an idea. It's not tangible. And an idea can't be said to be a cause of anything. It has no mass. It has no weight. It has no velocity. So it may describe things well, but it can't be said to explain them. And people tend to describe behavior with these construct labels. They say the animal is jealous. The animal is stubborn. The animal is, um, you know, misbehaving on purpose. And none of these things can be true from a scientific point of view. The animal lacks impulse control. And we see people doing terrible things to get animals to behave as we want them to behave based on these misunderstandings that there's something inside the animal that's producing the misbehavior. Instead, science tells us that it is behavior that has a function. They are cowering in a corner or snarling and nipping because that has served them well in meeting some goal. We cannot tolerate it. We need to teach them to do something else when they're afraid or dominating. But this is not something that if we did a necropsy on these dogs, we would find where their impulse control organ has failed them. Impulse control is a good example because it's a very popular explanation nowadays for misbehavior. But when I say to my clients and my students, what do you mean by your dog lacks impulse control? That is not a thing. It is a label. It's an adjective, a description for something your dog is doing under some conditions that you don't like. Tell me what that is. People will often say, my dog lacks impulse control. And by that, I mean that when I open the door, they run out into the street where they could hurt someone or get, or get hurt. And I say, okay, so your dog does not run through the door in the bathroom. Your dog doesn't run through the door in the kitchen. But when you open the door to the outside, under that particular context, your dog runs out. And they'll say, yes, because it lacks impulse control. And I explain, impulse control is a label. It can't cause anything. It has no tangible form. But we can ask, what are the outcomes that the dog is accessing when it charges through the door? It gets to be free outside. It may find food in the trash. It may find another dog to play with or fight with. All of these things can be said to be observable outcomes that explain why the dog rushes out, what the dog is trying to get. Or maybe it's escaping a neglectful home. Now we can ask, what do we want the dog to do instead? Well, most of us want our dogs to stand or to sit at the door while we open the door calmly and then give them a cue, go on before they leave. We ask, can we teach a dog to do that? We absolutely can. Can we teach it by shaping the behaviors by small steps? First, teach the dog to sit while I move around and leave the room and come back in a very easy condition for a food treat or a ball toss or praise words or a scratch on the flank? Can I then move it to the door in the kitchen 
And then can I move it to the door once fluent to the outside? Can I reinforce the dog when I touch the do doorknob, when I turn it, when I open the door just a little bit and then close it all the way through to the final goal behavior and then give the cue? Of course we can. So we want to be careful to learn not to describe our dog's behavior or our learner's behavior with these labels that are just descriptions like colors. We want to describe what the dog is doing and the conditions in which they're doing it. Because no learner is misbehaving 100% of the day. They behave and misbehave according to the conditions and the outcomes they've experienced for those choices in the past. So Skinner said, all the way back in 53, I bring this to you because this is information we've known a long time, but it's very counter to the personal recipe approach. And so it's been hard to shine this light on our teaching. He says it doesn't help in the solution of a practical problem to be told that some feature of an individual's behavior is due to frustration or anxiety. My dog is anxious. My dog is frustrated. That's not enough to use a label. We need to look at the environment and their learning history and ask what's inducing the frustration from the environment? What is inducing the anxiety? And then how can we change the environment so that it induces the behaviors that we need? So we talk about the ABCs, the three-term contingency. And by contingency, we mean dependency, that the cue is given, the behavior depends on what cue is given, and the positive reinforcing consequence depends on what behavior is chosen, antecedent behavior consequence. So antecedents don't cause behavior. Technically, they signal when to do the behavior that will be reinforced. So when you're driving and you see a stop sign, it doesn't cause your foot to move to the brake. It signals the behavior consequence relationship, the contingency. If you put your foot on the brake, you'll be reinforced with a car that stops. Behavior controls our outcomes. And we can now not imagine a world where we didn't have this system that allows us to control our outcomes. And consequences should be seen as more than just rewards. They are the reason why we behave in particular ways given particular conditions. So I have a lot of my work is at zoos. I'm gonna ask us to move aside from the discussion, the important discussion on whether we should even hold these animals in captivity. It's an important discussion. It's a difficult and complicated one. But I've chosen to help those animals that are in captivity by training the trainers how to work with them with predominantly positive reinforcement learning solutions. So that's what I want you to focus on today. This is a silverback gorilla. Were it not for this training, this learning that the gorilla has done and the training these keepers have done at the Columbus Zoo, uh, this animal would need to be darted with anesthesia to work on his teeth. Instead, we can bring a learning solution and then improve the quality of their life, improve welfare. Good boy. 
Now I want to play it again and make a very important point that is a very modern, very contemporary philosophy of training, very new. And that is in the older days, 20 years ago and older, we would have required that that animal not respond to anything but a command. And it was a threat. If the animal didn't respond to the command, then we would punish them. Nowadays, there are times when we have to use commands. Like when I say to a child, stop, I want them to stop immediately and look at me for more information because danger may be in their path. But for most of the time, what we try and establish and we succeed is a dialogue, not a one-way command monologue, but a two-way dialogue where the animal influences what we do and we open our training up to hear them. So I want you to look again and see that the gorilla cues her when he's ready by opening his mouth. She does not require that he keep his mouth closed until she issues the command and the threat. Rather, she enjoys and counts it as excellent training that they have a relationship where they can dialogue, share communication, and influence one another. On the very first repetition, watch him cue her with his bottom lip. You see his mouth open before her cue. Good boy. Wash. Good boy. And there are many other things I could point out that are excellent training, but I don't have the time. I wanted you to at least see where we have gotten after all of these decades of science investigation and application, we understand now that the highest level of training has a dialogue, not a command monologue. And learning how to dialogue and teaching animals that they can influence us and that we change what we do when we're not successful is, is very important. Sorry. I have a very sensitive mouse pad. And we can do this with dogs. Look at the wonderful antecedent arrangement um, that we see here. Uh, this building this frame allows the right behavior to be easier for the dog. So the purpose of antecedent arrangement is to make the right behavior more probable, and then reinforcement is much higher, which gives the animal more information about what to do to control those reinforcers. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting for all of us to see what parents have learned in all of these years that we in animal training have been getting better and better and more and more higher and higher welfare, more and more dialogue and exchange between us and our learners. Let's see what parents do. Surely this would have trickled into parenting. Usually he's kicking and screaming and tired from a long day. So here's what we do. Hold his arms down, sit on top of him. He knows it doesn't last long. Open up. <laughs> And I tell him, go ahead and cry, because then I can see your teeth. Go ahead. Come on, cry. No. So in my philosophy, if it was necessary to pin a child down 
and force them to get their teeth brushed while they scream and I ignore those parts of their dialogue. If it was necessary, I would do it. But it is not necessary when one understands the general principles of behavior and learning and how to apply them well. You brush your teeth? Whoops, sorry. You brush your teeth? Brush your tongue. Brush your tongue. Good job. And this child is much younger than the boy who was given absolutely no influence over the procedure and no meaningful outcome for complying. Look at the antecedent arrangement. The mirror, very clever reinforcer for such a young child and for older ones too. And all that attention. And we hear the Disney music in the background, one-on-one -on -one time with a parent. There are many motivators and we, we, we can use them. So these are the six keys to training in a modern contemporary style that greatly improves the control the animal has over their own outcomes with their natural behaving and learning tendencies. What does the problem behavior look like? In observable words, what do you see? Don't use the labels for behavior when you're training. We can talk labels when we're casually describing a dog that's dom very dominating, but I'm always aware that that's casual lay talk, layman speak. When we are training and we are acting at our, our best, most educated selves, we wanna describe behavior in observable terms. Then we understand behavior never occurs in a vacuum. It is always influenced by the conditions, the events in the past and in the current time. And those are the things that help us predict what animals will do. If we can predict what they're gonna do, we can build a program to train to it. Then we ask for the consequences, what's the function? Is the animal going to move towards something we offer or are they shirking and running away? What can the learner do instead for the same function? So the, uh, the um, dogs can get treats, the gorilla can get an apple, the poison dart frogs can get flies for doing the behavior that will help them be successful in human care. What new skills? We say that it is skills that give us freedom in life. The more skilled we are, the freer we are because we have more choices we can competently make. So we're always asking, what do I need to teach? What do I need to teach the dog to stay at the door until I give the cue to leave? And then what are the prerequisite skills? The dog needs to know how to sit in an easy context first, and then they can, we can move it to the difficult, demanding context of the outside door. So this is what our model looks like. We start with the ABC. A hand is often offered as the antecedent. The dog growls. The hand is removed or even stopped for a millisecond. Some people may take that information and say, Therefore, I'm going to put a leather glove on my hand and I'm not going to remove my hand. I'm going to show that dog it can't control me. That is not a modern approach to training, nor is it a scientific approach. Rather, we ask, what can the dog do instead when I offer my hand for the same meaningful outcome? The dog can step back and I'll remove my hand. But that's not enough. I don't want a dog that steps back in order for me to remove my hand. I want a dog that runs to my hand when I offer it. And that will be the new skill. So we'll teach that new skill for outcomes of value to that animal. This is our biology. We are born 
to move our behavior according to these principles. So let me show you some more examples. At this um, uh, situation with a ring-tailed lemur, the keepers were worried that because the tail was so long and heavy, off the scale, it would give the wrong weight. So they trained it. Get your tail. Good. Now we ask, how did they teach it? Well, they used our sharpest tools. They shaped it with positive reinforcement. They used their hand as a prompt to get the attention to the tail. They slowly faded, or not so slowly in this case, faded the hand. Then they had to bring it back because the animal left the training uh, session. They used positive reinforcement, great ABC arrangement, and a lot of skill. And this was the result in one session. So this idea that people say that we must punish, physically punish animals because it's faster and it's an emergency is incorrect information. Once people have the skills that these trainers have, they will train fast. We won't know. Doesn't matter. Good. 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 I just lightly touch your finger. Good. Good. Let's grab your tail. He's just good. Good. His fingers wrapped around that time. Good. 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 Oh, God, his thumb squeaked it. Good! Yay! <laughs> oh, honey! I'm just yelling at him. <laughs> Here's these. Good. This is a very happy, always laughing group of trainers. I also want to make the point that animals don't need to be hungry. This is such a misunderstanding. We don't need to be hungry to learn and, and we may work for food and animals don't need to be seriously deprived either. And all of the animals that I'm showing you are very plump and I've picked them purposefully to make that point. Here they want to, um, uh, weigh the alligator, American alligator, in a black bucket uh, where a scale is. We could do it old school in this way with force. But when we know about learning and teaching, we don't have to. It's just not necessary. Beauty and his grace. Mr. United States. <laughs> Do we know his gender? No. Is that, okay? that doesn't get you any food. Good. Well, why would he go in there? Because he's learned that it results in a treat. And again, this animal is not a starving or a very deprived animal. He works for small pieces of meat with no problem. 
Now I always ask, what will he do on the second time? Because it's not hard to force an animal to do what we need it to do, but it may be hard to get them back for the next time we need them to do what we need them to do. So I'm always careful when I'm coaching to watch what the animal does, give him free choice, so to speak. He's behaving for that food. The water. What does he do oh. next time? And he goes right back around those blocks. Can you throw more holes in the bottom? And chooses to go into the box. That's significant to me. We want animals to choose to do that, not because they are escaping force or coercion, but because they are approaching an outcome that is of value to them. Great antecedent arrangement with this parrot. They've taught it to choose to put his head through the hole so the veterinarian can x-ray a damaged wing without worrying about getting bitten, but also without netting the bird, anesthetizing the bird, wrapping the bird up in a towel. So there are times where I, I wrap my own bird up in a towel to do a procedure with my veterinarian. But I always am asking, is it necessary? Or would a learning solution in competent trainer's hands be another way? Here's Percy. He doesn't need him. Again, look at the beautiful antecedent arrangement. They've built this frame and they can move the bars smaller and larger, depending on the animal that they're training. <laughs> Good. And they're able to do a mouth swab for bacteria. And then I want to just, I just want to alert you to this science fact that you don't need to do something wrong to learn how to do it right. If those antecedent conditions are arranged just so precisely, animals will do the right behavior over and over and over again and never have to contact an error to learn what not to do, or very rarely. It's called errorless learning, but in fact, it's really error reduced. We try and arrange our antecedents to reduce errors because errors slow learning down, they produce aggression in animals because an error means no reinforcement and frustration behavior. So I just wanted to let you know that's there and then you can dig into that body of literature. And this graph shows before, uh, to the left of the vertical line, the pigeons that were taught to peck a spot on a piece of paper with a very carefully arranged antecedent set up, had 25 errors in 28 sessions. The pigeons who learned to do it without careful antecedent arrangement had 3,000 errors in 28 sessions. 3,000 errors are not necessary. Think of that as 3,000 um, withholding of valued reinforcers. No wonder they're aggressive and frustrated. So here's another kind example. Of been reinforced for a little bit of the hokey pokey. So um, what we're working on is. I was coaching this one. Rather than, and she was saying she's um, trying to train the armadillo to keep so its feet still so that they can do a sonogram on her belly to see if there's a baby. So feet on the floor is a good tangible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the criteria that I was worried about before, which is why I was got a little bit of the hokey pokey because I was reinforcing her for moving her feet around. So um, 
rather than. I suggested she change that criteria, that she use an antecedent arrangement where the feet are not so slippery. And then she can just reinforce for number of seconds in position for the sonogram wand. So clever is this young trainer. She put down sandpaper and that was the end of the problem with the moving feet. She would have never gotten that animal to keep those feet still because the wood was slippery. Not because the animal didn't want to earn those food treats. And then there was the problem of ginger. And um, T.I. said that I can go for um, 10 minutes late. So I'm going to just quickly move through these examples, hoping to inspire you to come up with your own. Ginger is a beaver who um, was allowed to walk around freely in the hippo enclosure, but she refused to come back. So rather than force her or punish her, which of course we could always do, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're smarter. Punishment is not hard for us to do. No one needs to learn how to do that better. We all know how to do it because we are raised with it. Instead, we're looking for ways to get the goals we want met with less force. And this is what they came up with. Beavers naturally bring sticks home to their den. So when they're ready for her to go home, they put down a stick. And she's learning, learning how to get, kick the door open, how to carry two at one time. At one point, she even takes a pumpkin with her. So for people who feel this is innate, don't forget to notice all the learning going on in this program, in addition to her natural tendencies. We'll just speed it along. And now it's become such a great program that she's walking freely around the zoo right among the visitors who are, of course, inspired to protect animals by that close encounter with this beaver. And um, when they're ready for her to go home, they just put down a bigger, better stick. An African white-collared raven doing a voluntary medical procedure. Watch for the A, B, C, the Q, the behavior, and the consequence. And then to wrap up, that brings us to this idea of our ethical standard. And of course, ethics is a very soft subject. Science does not contribute well um, to the complexity that is our ethical standard. The one that I suggest is that you ask always, when you're using force and coercion, is it necessary? Is it the lack of your training skill? Then bring in a more skilled trainer and learn get more skills yourself. If it's necessary, then sometimes we have to do, especially in emergencies, we may force an animal or coerce them to do something that keeps us safe or them safe. But rarely in my 45 year career have I found that it's necessary. However, it does require education, skill and supervision to develop the skills to do it another way. So we say, as you're choosing your procedure, always make sure you get off at exit one, that you have a well animal 
nutritionally well, they're in a good physical environment, a clean, spacious environment. Then arrange your antecedents, and I've given you lots of examples that make the right behavior easy. Then use positive reinforcement to shape with small steps the behavior you want to see. And then before you use any of the other procedures, which I don't have time to talk about, but which many of you know already and can study further, that we have a speed bump that slows us down so that before we do something that is coercive, that for which the motivation is escape, that we ask ourselves, is it necessary or is it a lack of education, skill, and supervision? So here's Emmett the bear from Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. And I want you to watch when the trainer says, I need more foot, how well he dialogues with her about that need. So the technician says, I need more, and the trainer uses a finger cue. He pushes all the way out and then comes in with a long leg. And my critique of this training was it would be even better if they put a wooden sling underneath his foot or plastic along the mesh so that it was more comfortable. So we're always looking for ways to improve what we do to improve learning and welfare. And there's our voluntary blood draw, which we do with dozens and dozens of species at these zoos. So this is my last video, and then we'll be right on time, I think, uh, given the new time. Um, I show you this because this was trained by a lay person, not a professional trainer or teacher or behavior consultant, but she's worked really hard to learn and to be supervised and to get as much practice as possible with her bird. And you can see this is a well-fed, good weight on this bird. So this is not compliance due to force or, or deprivation. Notice she let go of the foot when the bird said, give me back my toe. And there's medicine in that yogurt. So if I were to put it into a meme, I would say, arrange the conditions beforehand to make the right behavior easier or more probable. Remember, behavior is an action. It's something we can observe, not a label. And make the right behavior worthwhile. Give it a purpose for doing. Because you said so is the weakest of purposes. Because there is an outcome that is the result of the behavior is our strongest approach. So I will stop the share now and come back to you. And if we have time, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Susan, for that wonderful presentation. No, you're welcome. Uh, 
yeah, it was a really interesting talk about um, how animals and humans learn. And I especially like the part where you discussed um, the ideas that, you know, humans have that actually is a barrier to, to teaching animals how okay. to behave well. Yeah, so I think that is something that we don't really talk about or we don't even uh, identify in ourselves. And I, I really thought that was a really great uh, thing that you brought oh, up. I'm glad to hear that. Good, good. <laughs> And we also really enjoyed the videos. <laughs> they were so ah, cute. They're wonderful yeah. trainers. Yeah, <laughs> the animals are amazing. Mm. Yeah, and they come ready to learn. They come ready to move where the environment moves them. And, and we this- can arrange the environment. So it should mm-hmm. be a win-win. Yeah, and exactly because you showed, you know, these behaviors that were trained in zoo animals, you know, why can't we do that in our companion animals, which, you know, exactly. uh, we have a really close relationship with. That are right in our home every mm. day. Yep, exactly the way I look at it too. So I think now we are ready for the Q&A session. So thank you everyone who sent in your questions. Um, due to time constraints, we might not be able to answer every single question and we apologize in advance. So um, we do have quite a few good questions coming in. Let's go to the first one. Okay, so are there ways in which we can successfully identify motivating operations if the animal was in a highly distracting environment? So I know my answer may not satisfy, but I'm going to give you my authentic answer is that if the animal is having a hard time with distraction, then the animal is not ready to be in that environment that training for distractions is one of the things we do after the prerequisite skills are mastered. Then we start to fade in small, minor distractions, and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. So the expectation that an animal should behave as we've trained in a distracting environment that we have not yet trained is is something I would say needs to be reconsidered. Thank you. Um, Okay, next question could be a bit uh, controversial, (laughs) Um, but you might get this a lot. Do you think it's acceptable to use coercive methods of training if the only other option for that pet in that context is euthanasia? Um, I may, I may. And so you may hear, and, and given my hierarchy, you can see, that I did not create a hierarchy of procedures that does not have punishment on it. I have punishment on it, but it's on the smallest part of the hierarchy with the biggest speed bump, the biggest barrier. We should do it very, very rarely. So I challenge people who think that their choice is between uh, euthanasia or punishment to reconsider whether or not that's accurate, or is it between euthanasia and poor training skills? Because in 45 years, 25 of which has been spent working with non-human animal learners, in those 25 years, I have never uh, developed a punishment program. We have always been able to either change the environment in which the animal is behaving, and or teach them the behaviors they need to do different things instead. So if it was between euthanasia and force, I might, I might come right through the door. But so often when I'm presented with that choice, I find that there's a lot of other choices um, in expert hands. Thank you, Susan. That was a really, really good answer. And I think um, a lot of people out there would like to think, you know, that euthanasia, uh, that punishment is the only option. But I think from talk today, you know, actually there's so much more that can be explored, I think. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Okay, so the next question. Um, The training in zoos, they are in a very controlled environment, um, but pet dogs are often not in such an environment. Um, they have access to resources, all kinds of resources, all the reinforcers, sorry, all the time. 
and uh, confinement is sometimes met with resistance from the owners. Um, confinement provided the basic needs of the dog is met, um, such as adequate exercise, opportunities to indulge in normal behavior. Um, so do dog owners have to completely change how they interact with their, with their dog to use these techniques? Not at all. Um, I think, again, it's by a case-by-case -case basis. I have one dog that is always on a leash when we're walking out in the public. I have another dog who will stay in heel position by my feet. So it's my responsibility to teach the first dog to do that if I find that it is necessary. And then, of course, resources are very a very real limitation. Do I have the time? Do I have the skill? So you may hear that I'm a very realistic thinker. I'm a very practical person. It's not all flowers and sunshine all the time. But when people say that my dog has access for free to all of these reinforcers, I might say to them, unless we control some of those reinforcers, we're not going to be able to teach your dog. And that might be the choice that you have to make. Very often people have said to me, I can't move the couch. I can't, I absolutely cannot move my couch when moving the couch would make the right behavior easier for the dog. I can't make the barn brighter so that going in at night is more attractive. I just can't. And I have said to clients, if you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that, then, then we have to accept the dog's behavior as we, as we find it. Because learning is the result of the environmental pressures, the environmental conditions under which we are behaving. If people are unwilling to change any of those components, animals can't be held accountable for what they don't know. So the next question is on- Oh, and, and can I interrupt? I just wanna make a very important point. Much of my animal career has been with free flying birds, doing research with free, free flighted birds and helping trainers who are flying their birds free in zoos. And so that would be another example of how even when there are uncontrolled reinforcers, you can still compete with the reinforcers you offer if you shape the behavior carefully. I think that's important to add. A really good point. So the next question is about um, dogs in shelters. So for dogs that are living in shelters and that have a history of abuse or neglect, um, what would be the frequency that this sort of training needs to be carried out um, to have the best success over time? Yeah, you know, it turns out that I used to, um, I was taught that training should happen as much as possible every day. But we have learned that animals remember really well the behaviors that control their valued outcomes. And so as much as possible, but resources are our big limitation in shelters. And we have to accept that. Resources is a limitation at zoos as well, because they're caring for every aspect of those animals' lives. Um, and so we have to build programs that um, are sensitive to resource limitations. So we come up with ways to do it that are less resource intensive. Maybe we would not teach the dogs to stop barking with an ABC approach. Maybe we would use a Pavlovian approach. There's a great study um, by Clive Wynn who's someone who you might want to invite to speak with your community, um, where he showed that just tossing food, not contingently, freely, to the dogs in the shelter reduced their barking. Just pairing a human showing up with food being tossed into the kennels and the dogs markedly reduced their barking, which made them more attractive for adoption. That's a much easier plan than training dogs to sit, stay, keep their jaws closed, you know? So we have to work with the limitations that we have, but we do and we succeed. Thank you. I think uh, this, this next question is um, in also related to, to shelters, especially. Um, Good. 
yes, the question is whether or not um, if the dog is overwhelmed with, with fear, um, then is there a situation where um, the dog is so fearful that it's unable to learn operantly? So in that case, then what would you do? It is very rare. And that's why I showed you the picture of the boy with the temper tantrum. He was out of his mind with anger, but he still laid down on the one shady strip. So this idea that we're never operant, I think is probably not accurate. But an animal can be so fearful that the only operant that behavior they choose is sticking to a corner or under a bed, that that's an operant choice as well. In that case, I might bring on my, I say my science sibling, the veterinarians, to help me with medical uh, drug treatment. And then when the dog is calmer physiologically because of the medicine, I would be able to help them um, uh, help them experience and interact environments less fearfully. So by no means would I ever advocate for only operant solutions. We have to keep our science siblings close. And I work in interdisciplinary teams every single day. That's a great question. Um, yeah, there's quite a few questions about this topic specifically, because I think in Singapore, um, we do have a population of uh, dogs, uh, that yes. dogs treat, uh, treat dogs, which yes. we call them Singapore specials. <laughs> right. And they do come in with lots of uh, issues with fear and anxiety. And sometimes it's right. extremely difficult to, to work with them because absolutely you know, they are extremely fearful. That's right. And so to treat a very fearful dog with force of coercion is to only dig a deeper hole. So we need to take that off the table as quickly as possible. And then we need to empower them to find that place where they can use their behavior effectively in ways that are not just escape behavior. And we may need our veterinarian help and we need a very sensitive, experienced hand really great observing skills for those dogs are necessary to see the smallest courage, the smallest movement towards something and away from the corner to be able to catch that. And we may, we may also come up with very creative solutions like um, automatic food dispensers so we can get the humans out of it as quickly as possible and then fading humans in becomes one of the more distant goals. Can you envision an environment where we're able to teach the animals to use their behavior to access important outcomes without a human in the environment, just with an electronic feeder? So we might be able to brainstorm around those kinds of solutions. Okay, so yeah, that was a really great response, Susan. So thank you so much. And I think we are almost uh, running out of time now. So okay. we can end the session here for today. Um, thank you everyone who submitted your questions. Um, we have come to the end of the webinar and we hope that you enjoyed today's session and you are inspired to create positive behavior change in your pets. So head over to our Facebook page, Animal Bus SG, for more educational information on animal behavior and you can like the page for regular content. So thank you everybody for joining us today uh, on this Saturday morning and have a, great, have a great day ahead. Thank you all. Wonderful, wonderful to make the world smaller together. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.